thought we would do something uh, uh, we haven't done, and that is give a survey of what we call the minor prophets. The uh, minor prophets, of course, are minor because their works are shorter than the major prophets. Now, to some who have been on my in my uh, class on Sunday afternoon, some of that will certainly be familiar to you. But um, I thought this would be a good thing for us to do, and I will have to move rather quickly to do what I want to do in the way I've set this out. We'll look at Hosea, Joel, and Amos tonight. And let me emphasize right now concerning scriptural references. Please go ahead and have pen and paper. Now, when this is done, it'll be recorded, and it can be uh, put, as Sonia did, onto the YouTube, uh, the Church of Christ, uh, Spring Church of Christ YouTube place. But um, right now, for your own study, get your pen and paper so you can write down these scripture references as we study these minor prophets and try to get through with them in an appropriate period of time tonight. Um, I hope that this will be done in a way that will, if you haven't studied them lately, whet your appetite to go study and see them. I've always said as a preacher that if you're going to be an effective preacher of the gospel of Christ today, then do not stay long away from the prophets because they showed us how to reach people and say the truth of their day to those people. And sometimes it was not very pleasant, but they always told the truth. They always dealt with the issues. They did not mince words. So there's a lot here for us to consider, a lot here for us to, to learn, and I hope that this survey of our study of the Minor Prophets be helpful. And we want to begin, as I said earlier, with Hosea, Joel, and Amos. These uh, Minor Prophets are 12 in number. And in the Hebrew Bible, they're just simply called the 12. I've already mentioned to you they're minor only in the sense that these works are shorter than are what we call the major prophets. And uh, that's important to understand. Um, seven of these prophets delivered their primary messages Seven of these prophets delivered their primary messages to Judah. Um, two, Amos and Hosea spoke to Israel. Uh, two, Jonah and Nahum to Nineveh. And one, Obadiah to Edom. These books are not strictly in chronological order. So I've decided to try to get through them in a survey fashion. And again, I urge you to have pen and paper to write down these scripture references to study them in groups of three. And that's the reason I said a moment ago that we're looking at Hosea, Joel, and Amos tonight. So we will actually treat them in order of their composition so as to fit their messages into uh, historical context. These were real people. They were guided by God to speak to God's people, the things God's people had to hear for their own spiritual good. How they came to be in their present order, we simply don't know. Uh, so we have to let it rest at that. The three prophets whose writings concern us in this lesson, we think, were among the earliest of the writing prophets. Now, I cannot exhort you enough to consult, consult good commentaries to get a lot of this information. But at the same time, you can study all the commentaries of the world and not take the place of you reading the very text of the Bible. Now, let me begin by looking at the background, the background of Hosea, Joel, and Amos. First of all, Joel is nowhere dated in terms of a king's reign or a historical event, at least whose date is known to us. There's good reason to view it as an early work. The enemies of the Jews named in this book, and they are 
uh, the Philistines, Edom, Egypt, and Phoenicia. Are the enemies of Israel before the exile? Its early place in the sequence of prophetic books likely, uh, underscore the word likely, indicates that Jewish tradition counted them as ancient documents, and that Joel in particular was one of those ancient documents. Joel was from Judah and prophesied to his own countrymen. Now, we know that because of what he wrote in Joel chapter 3, verse 1, Joel 3, 1, and chapter 2, verse 15, verse 23, and verse 22. The scholars who know Hebrew tell us that this is a, quote, literary gem, unquote, because of its fluent and polished style. Well, I'll have to take the word for it because I simply don't know Hebrew to read it in the original. But that's what the scholars say. We see a terrible locust plague and accompanying a great drought on the occasion of Joel's prophecy. Joel 1 and verse 2 and verses 17 through 20. Joel 1, 2 and verses 17 through 20. Now, we remember Joel, at least I think you will, Joel as the prophet quoted on the day of Pentecost as recorded in Acts 2, Joel 2, 28 through 32, quoted in Acts 2 by Luke, verses 17 through 21. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So we see there in Acts 2 an inspired commentary on the fulfillment of the prophecy made by Joel in Joel 2, verses 28 through 32. Amos was a native of Judah whose principal task was to prophesy to the northern kingdom of Israel. He lived in a little place called Tekoa, some 12 and a half miles southeast of Jerusalem. And the kings that are mentioned in Amos, chapter 1 and verse 1, help us date his work at somewhere around 750 B.C., which puts him contemporary, roughly so, with Isaiah and Micah and certain others. I think that his call to do the work of a prophet is very interesting. And uh, look at Amos chapter 7. Verses 14 and 15, Amos 7, 14 and 15, to see more about that. Because he had no schooling to that end. His, he had no background in the prophetic or priestly line. Yet we see that God called a righteous man from a very humble occupation to serve as a very bold preacher of reform urging Israel to return to the truth they had forsaken. His occupation was a dresser of sycamine trees. Sycamine tree is a very large tree. It bears fruit, something like the fig. And he also was a herdsman. So he had a very simple task, but to that pastoral society, it was an important one. We need to note, too, that this certainly links it up, that is, the time and the society to much of what goes on in America today. The national prosperity of Israel was at its peak. It was called from Judah to go up to Israel and prophesy out of the royal kingdom. They were a idle people because they were a rich people, and great national decay had set in. Amos chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Now, don't lose sight of the fact that Israel is a theocracy. That means it is not only a spiritual nation with a spiritual law, but that same law, the law of Moses, governed them in civil and social activities and so forth. You might say that Amos was a prophet dealing with social justice since the law of Moses dealt with justice concerning how the people lived among themselves and their society. 
we look at Hosea, and he has the distinction of being the only, the only writing prophet from the northern kingdom. He preached to his own people for about half a century or possibly more, and that would put him working somewhere around the middle of the 700s B.C. also, Hosea chapter 1 and verse 1. And in reading Hosea, he refers to the northern kingdom of Israel by its largest tribe, Ephraim, Hosea 4.17 chapter 5, verses 3 and 5, and in other places in the book. This prophet's work is set against a background of a terribly tragic and horrendous family life, Hosea chapters 1 through 3. He was told to take a wife of whoredoms, and we don't know what that means. She was already a practicing prostitute or whether she was of that background and became one because she committed adultery with, the Bible says, many lovers. But here's the thing about it. He ordinarily, keeping the law, wouldn't have chosen a woman like this, but God told him to do it because as God's spokesman, God's mouthpiece, God's prophet, he wanted him to understand how God felt about Israel leaving the law and running under all of the wickedness they could, which primarily had to do with adultery, uh, uh, adultery that was connected with idolatry. He continued, though, to love his wife, and he actually, as you read the book, realized he bought her back out of slavery. So his experiences with Gomer, G-O-M-E-R, his wife, was to illustrate God's own relationship with Israel. In other words, when Israel left doing God's will, God said, you're just like a woman who commits adultery on her husband. God still loved Israel, but he could not condone her sins any more than Hosea could do the same with his wife. Yet he still loved her, and in time, he dealt with her accordingly. And so some have called Hosea the prophet of love because of his continual efforts to bring her back. Now, that introduces to some degree the three prophets and their boldness and their call and their righteous lives, their determination to do what God told them, no matter what. Now we want to turn to the message of Hosea, Joel, and Amos. Of course, immediately, you know, it's a divine message. They were called specifically to deal with the people that God sent them to. Allowing for particular differences in settings, audiences, and we may say topics. We may say that the common message of these books is faithlessness, Repentance and restoration. Now, nothing new there. As you note that we've said time and time again, most of the New Testament's written to members of the church. It's great to see people believe and obey the gospel. But how much greater is it to see them live righteous lives however long they're here once they've been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins? So the message I'll say again that these prophets delivered to the people because they needed it was dealing with their faithlessness, their unfaithfulness to God, their need for repentance, and their need to be restored to God. Each prophet called attention to the faithlessness of his hearers, their faithlessness before the very God of heaven, whom they claim to be servants of. Joel assumes their sinfulness, and he warns of the day of the Lord coming to Judah. Joel 1, verse 15, and Joel 2, verses 1 and 2. 
Now, when you look at Amos, you'll see that he warned of the same sort of day up in the northern kingdom of Israel, or Ephraim, as he called it. He even lists, or catalogs, we may say, specific sins that would lead to such a day of the Lord. Amos 5, verses 18 through 20. You might also want to look at chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. It connects with that point. When you come down to the prophet Hosea, you'll find him accusing the whole nation of Israel of spiritual adultery. Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 through 19. He doesn't leave anybody out. The whole nation has committed spiritual adultery. But look what they do. Each one of the prophets speaking directly to the people to whom God sent them, the message they needed to hear, dealing with the issues of their day, pleaded for them to genuinely repent. Joel did this in Joel 2, 12 through the first part of verse 13. Amos did it in Amos chapter 5 and the first part of verse 15. And Hosea did it in chapter 10, verse 12, in the latter part of that verse. Now notice, once they deal with the faithlessness of God's people and the need for them to repent and even enumerating many of the sins they had engaged in, he then holds out the promise for all of them of restoration, restoration for those who will repent. Joel actually promises deliverance and prosperity in Joel chapter 2, verses 18 through 27. And Amos looks far beyond Israel's, what we may say is an impending destruction to the great blessings of the anointed Messiah, the blessings that he would bring Amos 9, verses 11 through 15. When you look at Hosea, you see that he emphasized greatly God's desire and willingness to forgive his people. Hosea chapters 11 through 14. Now, with that all set before us, let's look at the major, the major themes, or we may say issues, of Hosea, Joel, and Amos. I mentioned earlier the, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Now, this is an important idea. And, you know, it runs through all of the prophetical books, the whole prophetic section, every book, major and minor prophet. And I'll not attempt to list any references on that. It's just there for those who read the books to see. But we need to know, since it's used so much, what does that expression, the day of the Lord, actually mean? Well, usually it has to do with what formerly is called eschatology, meaning the last things. In both Testaments, Old and New. In the Old Testament, it's that day when a nation received its just consequences for engaging in sin and refusing to repent. There was simply no specific day for on which this particular day of the Lord would occur for all nations. Each, that is each nation, was to be judged at a time chosen by God. I may say here, as you look at all these various kinds of judgments, such as the judgment of Noah's great flood, or the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, or God through Israel as he took the land of Canaan, destroying the people off the land, bringing his judgment to bear against them, that every kind of judgment like that points to the final day of complete judgment at the end of the world, when the elements have melted with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works of therein are burned up. All of them were telling us that everybody must appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. 
each in these prophets were was to be judged then at a time chosen by God and judged by God. The day of the Lord was not for Israel and Judah alone. Now we know God used Babylon to punish sinful Judah many years later. He used the Assyrians to do the same in the northern kingdom. But in Isaiah 13, verse 6, he talks about punishing Babylon. He talks about in Jeremiah chapter 46, verse 10, bringing judgment against Egypt. And there are other nations he brought judgment against, Joel 3, verse 14. In other words, God takes note of what a nation does. There can be a national character. And we would do well in America to remember that, especially as the church in America as we labor to hold to the truth of the New Testament and pure, primitive New Testament Christianity and calling all men back to the old paths of the one gospel and the one Lord, and the one faith and the one baptism. The ultimate day, as I said, of the Lord foreshadowed by all other times of judgment in history, examples I gave you, is then the final and complete judgment before the judgment bar of Christ. Peter deals with that in the New Testament. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12. Now, we've already mentioned adultery. I don't need to go into that. But it's interesting that God calls those who are in covenant relationship with him, his children, that God calls their departure from the way he commands them to live spiritual adultery. And one of the most powerful figures of sin in all the scriptures then is the great prophet Hosea. He is used to set out infidelity to divine love by going through what God told him to go through. God's relationship to Old Testament Israel was frequently symbolized as a husband-wife relationship. Isaiah chapter 62, verse 5, and Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14. Thus, it is certainly appropriate to represent the nation's sins, especially idolatry, representing it as adultery. Hosea chapter 4, verses 12 through the first part of verse 13. This fundamental unfaithfulness to the law of Moses with God lay at the root of Israel's other sins. Hosea 4, 13, latter part of that verse, through verse 19. And when you turn to the New Testament, surely this is dawning on those who know their Bibles. When you turn to the New Testament, you're able to see that God warns us about sinning against God's love. James did that in James chapter 4 and verse 4. And then you have Paul showing the love that Christ has for the church by talking about the love of a man for his wife and the obligations he has to the other. In Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 33, God desires the church to be pure. And for us to love the Lord with all that we have and are. Now again, remember, Israel is a theocracy. They are a nation among other nations, a civil nation among other nations. So the same law that taught them how to worship God and serve him in spiritual things taught them also in the matter of civil and criminal matters and social actions. So the social conscience of the people of God needs to be stirred at times. If you look at Amos, you'll see that he was a very fiery prophet who evaluated people's religion through their conduct in society. 
Well, when you think about it for a moment, Jesus says, by their fruit you shall know them. And that lets us know God looks at us and our conduct and the society in which we live and does the same thing. In fact, as you study, notice the sins condemned among Israel's neighbors. In Amos chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, and verse 3. You'll also notice that Amos denounced the rulers of Israel as thieves. And if you want to see a rather vivid view of how their wives are caricatured, unmercifully, just read that. Amos 3, 9 through chapter 4, verse 3. Amos 3, verse 9, chapter 4, verse 3. He doesn't spare any words when dealing with them. He also talks about the abuse of the poor in the land, and he denounced that abuse very severely, Amos 5, verses 10 through 12. If you go over to the book of James in the New Testament, you'll see that James had similar things to say in that book, in chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Now, we all know that in recent years, and going back now for a good while, liberal religious groups, and I always by liberal mean those who teach doctrines that loose us from what God's word binds on us, have abandoned the Bible for what they would call social activism or the social gospel. Over the same period, we must, as faithful members of the church and not those who teach doctrines that loose others from what God and his word binds on them, must not become calloused and unconcerned for those who are poor and oppressed and imprisoned and helpless. For example, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the New Testament system, demands sensitivity to certain social issues. Abortion, murder of the baby in the womb, should not be abandoned to just anybody. The Lord's church ought to be the leaders in that, speaking up for those who can't help themselves. What about the plight of the elderly? They shouldn't be just left to federal agencies. The church has an obligation here. And so we need to be mindful of them. I think we're living in a time now with this COVID-19 virus that's causing us to have to do these things to be mindful of folks that need help. I'm glad for all the good that the government is doing and other agencies, but the church has an obligation here to be mindful of our own, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, and simply the golden rule of doing unto others as we would have them do unto us, to be mindful wherein we can help and be ready to help, regardless of what may take place when it comes to a disease. Then there's the disintegration of marriage and the family. Certainly, faithful Christians are greatly concerned about that. And we should be teaching the truth of God's word concerning the role of the husband and the wife and the father and the mother and the children and the obligations they all have one toward another and the love that ought to exist there. As we've been trying to study at spring in the auditorium class on Sunday morning for some time. I would have you in this light consider 1 John 4 and verse 20. Again, I'm not going to take time to read that. 1 John 4 verse 20, especially the latter part of verse 20. But I want to emphasize this point. I've done it before in sermons, but if you'll just think honestly with your own life and you're serving God, you'll see just how true what I'm about to deal with is. Because remember, the message of the prophets was the faithlessness of the children of Israel, repentance, and then restoration. Well, repentance is a costly thing. When you look at these prophets, Every one of them stressed the urgency, but they also stressed the difficulty of real, genuine repentance. Look at Joel chapter 2, 
and first part of verse 13 with that in mind. Joel 2, first part of verse 13. And here's why it's a very difficult thing, but a very important thing. Repentance always involves some hard things because it involves the will of man. First of all, it involves giving up evil as the Bible defines what is evil. Acts chapter 19, verses 18 and 19. It involves giving in to obedience to God's commands. Acts 2, verse 38. Now, those people of the Pentecost, those Jews were devout religious people. They were there doing what they thought they were supposed to do in service to God. Yet they learned that that didn't work anymore. They had to admit they had crucified and slain the Son of God. And as believers, notice they were told to repent. And then it means giving way to heaven's purpose for your life. That's one reason the New Testament is mostly written to Christians. It teaches us how to give way to heaven's purpose for our lives. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Our bodies are to be presented living sacrifices to God because our minds are renewed by the truth of God regarding how we're to think, speak, and live. So I suggest to you that the hardest thing to get people to do, as I've preached before, is to get them to fully repent as the Bible defines repentance. Repentance is a breaking down of the old stubborn will, the very seat of sin and rebellion against God, and turning to doing what God requires of one and teaching oneself the importance of doing it to be shaped into the very character of God. Now, let's look a little more as to maybe we can call this a guide to Hosea, Joel, and Amos. And we'll look at all of these books very quickly. We might call it a, a review or summarization or a very quick survey. Hosea begins with an account of Gomer's, his wife, unfaithfulness to Hosea. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Remember, Gomer symbolized Israel's unfaithfulness. And notice this. The names of her three children by Hosea express God's judgment of the nation of Israel. Note their names. Jezreel, scattered of God. Loruhema, not pitied. And Loami, not my people. Even the details of Gomer's adultery are given in chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. And then her restoration to the great prophet Hosea is described in chapter 2, verse 14, through chapter 3, verse 5. Now, the remainder of Hosea's book is a direct application of the word of God to Israel. The nation is indicted for its many sins, chapter 4, 1 through chapter 7, in verse 16. And he tells them plainly of the punishment which was to come. In chapter 8, verse 1, all the way through chapter 10 and verse 15. However, he says there's still hope, for God's love for the nation was still vibrant, real, and alive. Chapter 11, verse 1, through chapter 14 and verse 9. Then look at the book of Joel. Joel describes the terror of a great locust plague in Judah, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. And that foreshadowed the day of the Lord. Remember what we said about the day of the Lord for that particular nation, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Guess what he does? Well, in the light of that, he pleads for them to repent. Chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. 
And in doing so, he urged them then to look to the blessings which would follow them when they repented. Chapter 2, verses 18 through 27. But he closes his book with God's promise to bless mankind, as we noted early on in this study, through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, as quoted by Peter and recorded by the inspired Luke in Acts chapter 2, 28 through 32, which really is an inspired commentary on this prophecy from Joel, Joel 2, 28 through 32. The great blessings that resulted from that event are described uh, prophetically in chapter 3, verse 21. Then the last book we studied this evening, the book of Amos. Calling them by their capital cities, the great prophet announces God's judgments, not just against Israel, but against Israel's neighbors. Chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2 and verse 3. And they may have thought they were getting off, but after he finishes with them, he turns to Judah. Chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. And Israel. Chapter 2, 6 through 18. Now details about Israel's specific sins and the judgment that was about to come are related in that book in chapter 3, verse 1 through chapter 6 and verse 14. Now, if you continue to read, Amos was then given five visions of the coming judgment of Israel. He has a vision of a locust plague, chapter 7, 1 through 3, a fire that devoured everything, chapter 7, 4 through 6, the plumb line, chapter 7, 7 through 9, a basket of summer fruit, 8, 1 through 14, and the altar, chapter 9, 1 through 10. Now, there is a great sermon in each one of those, and I won't attempt to deal with that now, of course, but maybe in the future, a sermon on each one of them. Now, in the course of the vision, all these visions, Amaziah's opposition to Amos at Bethel in the northern kingdom of Israel is related, chapter 7, verses 10 through 17. And you can't help but admire and like the boldness and the faithfulness of the great prophet Amos and his love for the truth and his meeting of this wicked character, Amaziah. Well, the book then closes with a glimpse of the splendor of the Messiah's coming kingdom, in chapter 9, verses 11 through 15. Now, in closing for tonight, notice how the messages of these prophets grew out of their personal experiences and reflected their different personalities. Is there a lesson in that for us? Certainly there is. God's ability to use all types of people who love him, who repent of their sins, and who are determined at all costs to serve him in obedience to his will. God's ability to use all of those to his glory is rather amazing to say the least. And it should be consoling to every member of the church. Because God simply asks us to have an honest heart, Luke 8, 15, that will receive with meekness the engrafted word and will tenaciously hold to it all the days of our life. And you see that repeated over and over again among the prophets. Now, Lord willing, we don't know what the future holds now, but I think we'll have this same time next week. And we'll look at Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah. And I hope this very brief survey of these prophets has been beneficial to you in this midweek Bible study since we haven't been able to meet together. I appreciate everybody tuning in and hope that this has been a message that's uplifting and reminding us of our faithful duty 
to God every day of our lives. So Paul, have a good night and keep on keeping on. Thank you.